Hi, you guys. Welcome back to a very special edition to History Tea with Professor T. I'm Professor Tracy Daniel, and in this lecture, uh, we will be learning about Chapter 20 in your textbook, which is titled, if you're in the phone or textbook, from, bi uh, from Business Culture to the Great Depression. And this chapter will cover the 1920s to about 1930, 1932 or so. So we will go ahead and get started. The Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, this is what we're talking about in this chapter. The 1920s was definitely a decade of prosperity because economic growth is at the heart of American culture. You have uh, increased productivity, we have increased economic output, and a lot of that is due to the production of cars, due to, uh, due to the production of the automobile. The car is the backbone of American economic growth at this time. It's also during the 1920s that the American dollar will replace the British pound as being the world's most powerful currency. We're also entering really kind of a different society. We are a society of consumers by the 1920s because consumer goods will definitely proliferate. Americans are changing. Americans are starting to have Fun. Americans will begin to spend more of their money on leisure activities like going to the movies because Hollywood is big business at this time. We're starting to get talkies by the end of the 1920s. Uh, people are starting to go on vacations and they're starting to go to sporting events. It's also during this time that the music of the jazz age is being brought into people's homes. We have the radio and the phonograph. So now people are able to listen to radio programs and they're able to bring their favorite jazz artists into their homes with the phonograph. So you have entertainment that's being brought into people's homes. So I'll say in the 1920s, we start to get people, we see, I would say, a more fun America, if that makes any sense. However, even though this is known as being a pretty prosperous decade, like many other eras in American history, there is wealth, but that wealth is not evenly distributed. By 1929, the income of the wealthiest 5% of Americans exceeded the total income of the bottom 60% of Americans. So you still see um, this very unequal distribution of wealth where a very small population of people own the majority or have the majority of wealth in the nation. Furthermore, at this time in the 1920s, the majority of families don't have any savings. More and more people are living on credit. You buy now and you pay later. That probably sounds kind of familiar some 100 years later. And in many ways, we're in a similar position where many families don't have savings and more and more people are living on credit. 40% of the population in the 1920s are living in poverty. And it's not just for city dwellers. City dwellers aren't the only people who are having troubles at this time. Uh, farmers are really starting to decline. The farm incomes are declining and banks are starting to foreclose on farms. And so you see about 3 million uh, people who will move from more rural um, countryside areas into the cities where there are more job opportunities. It's in the 1920s that for the first time in American history, the number of farms and farmers will decline. Again, in the 1920s, the number of farms and farmers will decline, which is the first time that that will happen in American history. Now, Americans are still pretty distrustful of big business. And so Hollywood films will begin to propagate images of the American way of life, and it is spread across the globe. Also, during this time, we really, I would say, get your modern big business because a lot of your firms at this point will establish PR departments in their firms to justify a lot of corporate practices to the public. They will do this to try to counteract this distrust of big business. So your PR department 
departments, your public relations departments will uh, explain some corporate practices to the public. Also in the 1920s, industrial freedom takes on a different meaning because really the idea of industrial freedom, the definition will change depending on the side of the table that you're sitting on. During the 1920s, organized labor will lose about 2 million members. Really for a corporation, industrial freedom to them meant giving the business complete freedom of action. For them, Industrial freedom was used as a weapon against labor unions. Now, if you were a worker, industrial freedom has a completely different definition. For uh, members of the producing classes, industrial freedom meant um, ensuring that there is a minimum wage. It meant ensuring that there was a limit on the amount of hours that a person could work per day or the um, amount, there's a limit on the amount of days that a person could work per, per week. It means putting child labor laws into practice, you know? So industrial freedom, the definition of it changes depending on the side of the table that you're sitting on. And for a lot of big businesses and corporation, industrial freedom of their, or that wording is used as a weapon against the labor unions. And so in the 1920s, we definitely see um, a decline in union membership, okay? Now, the ERA or the Equal Rights Amendment. So we talked about last chapter that um, about the 19th Amendment, which was ratified in 1920. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. And so after this, uh, the ERA or an Equal Rights Amendment is promoted by Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. It proposed to eliminate all legal distinctions on um, account of sex, meaning you can't discriminate against someone because of their sex. Women needed equal access to education and equal access to employment. Now, the ERA campaign did fail. However, in 1967, the National Organization for Women, or NOW, will pledge to fight for the ERA. And in 1972, the ERA was was approved by the Senate, so the fight for the ERA is not over. Now, the uh, women's freedom, that the role of women in the 1920s definitely changes. It changes completely. Young women in the 1920s will really, I will say at this time, in the 1920s, Female liberation will resurface as a lifestyle, okay? Female liberation will resurface as a lifestyle. We see the rise of the flapper. Flappers were young women with a very distinct style. Their hair was usually bobbed really short. They would wear short skirts. They would smoke in public. Many of these women uh, took control of their reproduction by being on birth control. And so you start to see uh, women who are these flappers who will epitomize a change in standards of sexual behavior. Now, at this time, women's hair was usually kept very long. So flappers will go against that by cutting their hair very short. They will raise those hemlines because that wasn't seen as ladylike at the time. Now, as far as smoking in public, I always think this is pretty interesting. So um, my background is in communications and communication studies, or at least before I went to history, my BA was in communications. And in communications, while studying communications, uh, we learned about Edward Bernays, who was the father of modern public relations. And so at this time, uh, it's not ladylike. It's not considered ladylike for women to be able to smoke. Smoking cigarettes was not seen as ladylike at all. The tobacco companies know that if they can get women smoking, then they can get more profit. So they want a way to open up smoking to women, but they know that societal standards at this time are like, no, women are not supposed to smoke. 
So in pops Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays is like, if we can get women smoking, then you can make a lot more money. Well, how do you do that? He organizes something called a Torches of Freedom Parade, where instead of seeing smoking as an enjoyable act and something that you just want to do, he frames it or spins it, which is why he's also known as the father of spin. He spins it and says that women have the right to be able to smoke. So it goes from being a tobacco uh you know, a tobacco industry issue to this is your right to be able to smoke. So he organizes this parade where women would march down the street with their lit torches of freedom, aka their cigarettes, to say that you have the right to be able to smoke. So this is how um, tobacco companies get women to smoke by saying that it is your right. It is framed as more of a constitutional or human rights issue instead of really the issue is that tobacco companies wanted more money and they're leaving out 50% of the population. So you got to get that half of the population smoking. So that is how they do it by spinning it and framing it as this is your torch of freedom. Okay. So that will end part one. I'll come back to you uh, with part two in just a minute.